Amen. So Alan is actually leaving this week. He'll be going to Senegal uh, to be with um, Bill and Debbie there and uh, to continue in the work that they're doing there. Uh, it's just incredible what God is doing in and through them. And, and uh, I thank God that we've just... Amen. So Debbie went for, and she will not have to have prayer until April. God is faithful. So we're beginning a new series called Miracles Happen. How many of you believe that? Miracles happen. Amen. Uh, and we're going to be talking about God's power. Before we actually uh, begin speaking about some of the miracles of Jesus or maybe some of the miracles in the Old Testament, and I'm going to also include Pastor Beeb and one of the other pastors in, in this teaching time as well. Uh, I'm going to be talking the next week, you know, about the next two weeks about what, what we need to do in order for God's power to move in our lives. Because every one of us wants the power of God to move in our life. And God's, the, the moving of God's power is not just a random thing. You know, it doesn't just happen randomly, although it, it, it might seem that way to us. But oftentimes it, it has to do with, well, for, first of all, it always has to do with his mercy. But in order for us to really see God's power working, uh, there, there's things that are required of us as well. And we're going to be looking at some of those things in the next couple of weeks. Um, I want to open by way of reading 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And then we're going to turn uh, to the verse that I wrote in the letter to you all before Christmas, to Psalm 77. And we're going to look at verses 13 and 14. And then we're going to look at Psalm 77 and Psalm 66 and a few other places as well. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or rather chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, this is what the Apostle Paul wrote. He says, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. So that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. See, we serve a, a, a mighty God, an awesome God. And, you know, a, a trained speaker could maybe come up here and maybe, you know, woo you with words and with wise and persuasive speech and you might say wow that guy is a good speaker but it doesn't matter you know how many of you heard the story of Jonathan Edwards when he preached his sermon sinners in the hands of an angry God and yeah a few, one or two <laughs> and there was there was a move of God in that place and people were were just crying out to God and but this is how this is how that sermon went. It wasn't with wise or persuasive words, but it was as if he just went like this. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. See, he didn't, it wasn't with wise or persuasive words, but the power of the Spirit of God was there. He read the entire sermon off of his, off of his thing, with it right in front of his face, and he looked up every once in a while. I guess that was for effect. That wouldn't go in today's church in the United States of America. We don't want God's power. We want wise and persuasive words. We don't want a demonstration of the Spirit's power. We want a show. No, we don't. Not really, we don't. We don't. We want the power of God. I want the power of God. And you want the power of God. Because those wise and persuasive words, those, the, the, the show and the programs and all, those things wear off. And then you've got to come up with another big show and you've got to come up with something else wise and persuasive to keep the people coming. But you see, when God's spirit is moving, you know, uh, when, when God speaks to somebody and, and she tells somebody else what God has told them and, oh my gosh, it comes true. And God's power, I mean, that, that happened in this church in more than one occasion. When, when God speaks to us, he speaks to one person, they, and they, they give a word to somebody else, and the word comes true. I'm thinking right now of, of Kathy Starcher and with, and with uh, uh, Scott McGee and, 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 and Chris, uh, Crystal. Crystal's the other McGee's wife. 
Heather and their baby when they were told things by the doctor about their baby, but the Lord gave a word to someone and, and that, it wasn't, that the baby was going to be okay and it came about just as it was said. See, when God's spirit moves in power, you see, that's, that's something that, that grabs onto you and you say, wow, you know, there's something going on in that church. You know, that, that wasn't a program. That wasn't wise and persuasive words. That wasn't some, you know, something, you know, spectacular light show. Or that, that, that wasn't what brought people in. But it's God's power. You see, that's what we want to see moving in our lives. That's what you want to see moving in your life. And if it's not, it's only because you're not availing yourself of it. But God wants you to know that his power is available to you. And he wants to speak to you. And he wants to use you. And he wants, to, he wants his power to move in your life. Psalm 77, verses 13 and 14 say this. Your ways, O God are holy. What, what God is so great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. Most translations say works wonders, but it means the same thing. You are the God who works wonders. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. God displays his power among the people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your faithfulness. Amen. Lord, we want to see your power. We want your greatness, Lord Jesus. And we thank you and we praise you for who you are. Lord, have your way in our midst, Lord, as we look to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. Albert Einstein is reported to have said this, there are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle, and the other is as though everything is a miracle. I'm convinced in my life and in my heart that everything is a miracle. And we don't see it that way. But the fact that you woke up today and you breathed in air and you breathed it out and you're alive and you're conscience, conscious <laughs> and you can see, how, 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 how do I see with these two eyeballs? I have no idea, but I do. I can walk and I can think and God is miraculous. Everything about our lives is a miracle. C.S. Lewis in his book Miracles defined it this way on page five. It's a miracle is an interference with nature by supernatural power. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, Charles Ryrie quoted C.S. Lewis and he added this. He said, a miracle is more than something unusual. Although in ordinary speech, we often call such events miracles. In other words, if something unusual happens in our life, we say, wow, that's miraculous. And it, and it is. Let me tell you, it is. But a miracle, he says, is more than, than just something unusual. He says, a true miracle is something beyond man's intellectual or scientific ability to accomplish. It's not natural. Even though it may be unusual, a miracle is supernatural. That is now, here's, here's a part that might get somebody. That is from God or Satan. Ooh. Yeah, because he comes as an angel of light, doesn't he? And he's a deceiver. And, and, and in the last days, and we, we just might be living in the last days, he's going to have the ability to do supernatural things that are going to deceive even the elect, if that were possible, the Bible says. And many will be drawn away unto him. Enough of that. It's more than a highly improbable event. It injects a new element, the supernatural, into the natural order of things. Now, I, I'm pretty sure that every single one of you, whether you know it or not, has encountered a miracle in your lifetime. If you are here today and you love Jesus with all of your heart, if you've repented of your sins, 
and you've asked Jesus to come into your life, and if you are born again, you have experienced a miracle. You may not think of it that way. You may not realize it. We're going to maybe look at that if the Lord gives me time, if I speak, uh, if I get far enough. But I've got next week to continue. But you've experienced a miracle. And it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning of what God wants to do in and through us. Let's go back to Psalm 77. And, and let me just read the first six verses. This is what the psalmist wrote. He said, I cried out to God for help. Right there is the key. Right at the very beginning is the key for your miracle. If you want a, a miracle in your life, you can't do it. Like I said at the beginning, God's power, God's miracles don't just come randomly. Prayer is such a powerful part of our relationship with God. Crying out to God for help. We, we need, you know, that's why we start out every year in January. Uh, the first Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday uh, after the new year is always our first three nights of prayer. You know, and I don't know if, if any of you, you know, plan to attend. But I, I want you to know right now that 2016 is a very pivotal year. Actually, they all are. We need to be crying out to God. You need to be doing it in the privacy of your own homes, in your cars, as you're driving to work, wherever you're at. You need to be crying out to God. But, but there's something about when God's people get together and, and cry out to God as, as a group. There's something about that. So, so we're, this tomorrow night, listen, it's going to be cold tomorrow, okay? The high is going to be, what, 22 degrees or something like that? It's going to get down to like 10. Wind chills are going to be, it's going to be kind of like what it was last year, although last year was a little bit colder. We actually had to cancel one of the nights of prayer last year because of how cold it was. Let's warm the place up when we cry out to God. So I'm asking you to join me. If you could at least come out for one of those nights, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, if you want to see God's power in your life, well, one of the keys to that is for you to be crying out to God for help. If we don't cry out to him for help, he's, he's sometimes, that's, we, we, we like, we, we tie God's hands when we don't cry out to him. When we cry out to him, we release God to be able to move in power in our lives. And sometimes crying out to God is one of the last things we think of in, in, in a crisis situation. But listen to what the psalmist said. He said, I cried out to God for help. I cried out for God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands. Oh, Lord. And my soul refused to be comforted. It's kind of like what Jacob did when he wrestled with God and, 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 and he said, let go of me. He said, I will not let go of you until, until you bless me. I, 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 you know, I refuse to be comforted. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I'm going to cry out to you and I'm, not, I'm just not letting go. See, this is the kind of persistence that God wants in our lives. If we really want to see God move in power and if we, if we, if, if we just want to play church like we've been doing, then, then don't come to prayer. Don't cry out to God. Don't, don't wrestle with God. Just, just keep going along life as you've been doing. But if you really want to see God move in power, then cry out to him. With, with untiring hands and, and, don't, and refuse to be comforted until, until God moves because he wants to move on your behalf and he's going to move on your behalf when you cry out to him. He says, I remembered you, O God, and I groaned. I mused in my spirit of frame. Muse, that's, a, that's an interesting word. I mused. Have you been musing lately? Well, to muse means to think or to consider deeply. It's like meditating. He says, you, you kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I, I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart mused and my spirit inquired. My heart mused and my spirit inquired. And, and then, then listen to his musings. 
verses 7 through 9. He says, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? We have to ask this question. Why were all of his musings so dismal? Well, this was written by Asaph. And, and Asaph, there were many Asaphs in the Bible, but this ace, particular Asaph was someone who wrote after the destruction of Jerusalem. And you know, it, it looked like all the promises of God had been destroyed. Jerusalem's walls were torn down. The temple was burned. Every other building in Jerusalem was burned. There were no more sacrifices. This is what he was confronted with. Look at Psalm 74. This is also a psalm of Asaph. Look at verse 4. It says, Your foes roared in the place where you met with us. They set up their standards as signs. They behaved like men wielding axes to cut through a thicket of trees. They smashed all the carved paneling with their axes and hatchets. They burned your sanctuary to the ground. They defiled the dwelling place of your name. They said in their hearts, we will crush them completely. They burned every place where God was worshipped in the land. We are given no miraculous signs. No prophets are left. And, and none of us knows how long this will be. Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? We can be tempted to think these thoughts when we look at what's happening in our own country right now. But it's not too late. And it wasn't too late then either for Israel. God wasn't done with Israel. God's not done. God's purposes are always going to stand. God wants to use you and he wants to use me. And then we get to verse 10. Then his thoughts turned to God and all of God's works and all of God's mighty deeds. Listen, listen to what it says. Then I thought, to this I will appeal. To the years of the right hand of the Most High, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. I'm gonna, I'm gonna remember what God has done. Listen, wherever you're at right now, whatever you're going through, whatever trial or tribulation or trouble or distress or persecution, whatever you're going through right now, remember what God has done. God's power is real. And he's, and he's moved on your behalf and he's not done moving. Excuse me. And so point number one. God's way is in holiness. God's way is in holiness. Look at verse 13. He says, your ways, O oh God, are holy. What God is so great as our God? Your ways, O oh God, are holy. I said earlier, if we want the power of God to move in our lives, then we need to line up with him. Well, let, let me tell you, God's way is in the way of holiness. And Israel had forgotten that. They had walked away from that. They had turned their backs on God. 
And that's why all of that destruction, everything we read in Psalm 74, and all these questions we just read in Psalm 77, that's where they came from. God hadn't left them. God hadn't abandoned them. They had walked away from God. You want the power of God in your, in your life? Line up with God. And let me tell you right now, God's way is in the way of holiness. God's way is in the way of holiness. Your ways, O oh God, are holy. What God is so great as our God. And, and, and this is, a, this is a trouble, a, tr a trial even for us, isn't it? Because what is, what is Isaiah 55, verses eight and nine say? It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, or your ways my ways. Did I get that right? Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Verse nine, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's way is in the way of holiness, but God's ways are not my ways. God's thoughts are not my thoughts. That's a problem. So, so what happens in our life to help us to, to line up with his ways and his thoughts? Look, let me just jump down to verse 19, the, the first two parts of that verse. We'll get back to some more of it in a minute. It says, your path, some translations say your way. Your way led through the sea. Your, your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty water. God's way is in the way of holiness. But our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his ways. So God's way is through the sea. God's way is through the sea. Well, what does that mean? It means that if we want to line up with God, he may allow some things in your life that are not easy. Your way, his way, God's way, is through the sea. Turn with me to, to Psalm 66. Verse 1. He says, Shout with joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. Amen. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Then listen to verse 5. Come and see what God has done. How awesome his works in man's behalf. This is what the psalmist was doing in Psalm 77. When I go back there, he says in, in, in verse 10, then I thought, to this I will appeal the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. Now we get back to Psalm 66. And he says, come and see what God has done. How awesome his works in man's behalf. God has done great and awesome things. He moves on behalf of man. Listen to what he says. He turned the sea. God's way is through the sea. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. He says, come, let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. And you know, that's an awesome thing. An awesome, mighty miracle that God did when they went through the Red Sea on dry ground. But... What brought them to that place? Verse 8. Wait a minute. I'm getting ahead of my... Well, I'm going to go back to verse 7. Verse 8. 
Praise our God, O peoples. Let the, sound, let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, O God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us. This isn't theologically sound here. You brought us into prison. You laid burdens on our backs. You, you let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and water. But you brought us to a place of abundance. See, before you go through the sea, God's way is through the sea. In other words, God, in order for you to line up with God's holiness, because his way is in holiness, and your ways aren't holy like his ways, and your thoughts aren't holy like his thoughts, God's going to bring you into that place. To, in order to bring you through the sea, he's going to bring you to a place where there's no way out except by him. God's way is through the sea. Now, when the Egyptians were opposite the sea and they saw it, and they looked the other way and they saw the army of the Egyptians coming against them, What, did you bring us out here to kill us? God's way is through the sea. See, there was no other way but for God to work, for God to move. God's way is through the sea. And sometimes we go through difficult times, don't we? And we, we rebel against them, but allow God. Listen, is, is Jesus your God? Is God your Father? Is, does God desire to, to show himself strong in your life? Yes, he does. Then whatever he allows in your life is for him to display his power in your life. God wants to display his power in your life. His way is through the sea. Now, now notice one of the things it says there. I skipped verse 7. Uh, in, in Psalm 66, look, look what it says. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Why would the rebellious rise up against him when he splits the Red Sea for them? Did that happen, by the way? After they'd gone through the Red Sea, did not the rebellious rise up against him? There was a little phrase in Psalm 77 that I want to just grab onto here for real quick. Notice what it said in verse 6 of Psalm 66. It says, He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Go back to verse, chapter 77 now. Verse 19. Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters. Though your footprints were not seen. You see, sometimes... When God moves in power, God can move in power in your life and, and you won't see him. God's footprints weren't seen. See, this is why miracles will never prove the existence of God. Because once the miracle's over, I didn't, I didn't see his footprints. How do you, how do you know that was God? Was it really a miracle? When, when things are, when we're on the other side, when, when we got what we want, this, I, I love this about, you know, I, I was reading in, in Luke 17 and about the, the 10 lepers that were cleansed and, you know, Jesus said, go, go show yourself to the priest and they went and, and they were healed on the way and one of them ran back and he was a Samaritan and he fell down in his, before Jesus and he gave thanks to God. And he says, what, weren't all 10 healed? Was, was there no one left to come back and give glory to God except for this foreigner? And, and Barclay says this about this. Once a man gets what he wants, he never comes back. They got their miracle. They didn't care about Jesus really. They got what they wanted. See, sometimes we'll, we'll if we don't, See, you know, seeing is believing, the Bible says, wrong. See, we walk by faith, not by sight. They went through on foot, but his footprints were not seen. I was uh, at Blair's, and um, this just jumped out at me uh, when I was uh, doing a service there for Christmas, and I was singing, O Little Town of Bethlehem. 
Cindy was there and, and Beth was there. And uh, got to verse 3. And, and this is what verse 3 says of, of a little town of Bethlehem. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. See, sometimes when God is moving, your ear might not hear it. Your eyes might not see his footprints. But he's there. God's moving in power. Open up our eyes, O oh Lord. He, he said, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. God is speaking. God is moving. The devil blinds the eyes of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, remove the blinders from our eyes that we might see you when you move. Unstop our ears, Lord God, that we might hear what you're doing. But even if we don't see it, and even if we don't hear it, let us draw so close to the Lord. Let us continue to cry out to him that we will recognize what God is doing. Because look at what comes next with the psalmist in Psalm 66. Skipping verses 13 to 15, but he says, I will come to the temple with your burnt offerings and fulfill my vows to you. Listen, I love this verse. Vows that my lips promised and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. <laughs> Have we ever done that before? But then listen to what he says in verse 16. In verse 5, he said, come and see what God has done, how awesome his works on God's behalf, on man's behalf, I mean. And, and, and we have to see what, what the things that God has done in the past, but but even more importantly than that, we've, we've got to be able to say, verse, what verse am I looking at? <laughs> verse 16, I'm sorry. Come and listen, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what God has done for me. Let me tell you what God has done for me. It's great to be able to say, Come and see what God has done. How awesome his works in man's behalf. But how much more important is it for us to be able to say, let me tell you what God has done for me. I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward right now. Ah, oh, Lord. God's way is in the way of holiness. God's way is through the sea. It's for our good that he brings us to that place. It's for our good because God wants to move in power in our lives. But notice what it says afterwards there in, in Psalm 66. He says, I cried out to him. That was the same thing that he did in Psalm 77 verse one. I cried out to him with my mouth and his praise was on my tongue. But then he says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. God's made provision for us. Notice what it also says in, in Proverbs 28, verse 9. Do I have that right? Yeah. If anyone turns a deaf ear to my law, it, I don't know why the NIV, the new NIV puts instruction there. I'm sorry, I, I much prefer the 84 NIV, and that's what I use. No other translation has the word instruction. As a matter of fact, the word is law that is there. He says, if anyone turns a deaf ear to my law, even their prayers are detestable. In Psalm 66, he said, if I had cherished sin in my heart, 
the Lord would not have listened. These are, these are similar, but they're different. A lot of us can be in bondage to sin, and, 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 and we all have been. Everyone listening to my voice, there's been a bondage of sin that you've been in. There's been, there's been a besetting sin that you've had to deal with, or there's been some type of bondage that you've had to be delivered from. And, and God can do that, and God wants to do that. But, but the way to do it is through God's word and, and, and through God's law, because if I turn a deaf ear to God's law, my prayers will be detestable to him. In other words, and oftentimes we, we, may, we may understand and know a sin that we're, that we're dealing with, and, and we may hate it. So, so we're, we're dealing with this besetting sin, but we're, we're not, we don't cherish it. We, we hate it. Have, have you been there? I've, I've been there. I've been there where there was a besetting sin in my life, and I hated it. It just kept coming back. I, I wasn't cherishing sin in my heart. So, so what was the answer? Then my answer was to go to God's Word. My, the answer has always been God's Word. To run to God's Word and to allow God's Word to do its work in us and to change us, to mold us, to shape us. Because going back to Isaiah uh, 50, 55, it says this, as, as the rain and the snow came down from heaven and do not return to, to, to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You see, God's word does not return empty. It will accomplish what God has what it's set out to do. God's word will do it. Don't turn a deaf ear to, the, to God's law and to his word. But embrace God's word. See, it's, it's in God's word that we read this. If I sin, I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You have an advocate with the Father. But God wants us at the beginning of 2016 he wants us to get victory over besetting sins. So maybe you hate something that's, that you're struggling with. Good. But do more than that. Go to God's Word. And allow God's Word to lead you. I, 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 I hesitate to give any examples right now. I just don't have time. Maybe next week I'll pick up with this. But it's easy for us to turn a deaf ear to God's word when it's dealing with something in our life. When he's put our thumb on this, on this thing in our life that he wants to change, it's so easy for us just to turn a deaf ear to it. Let God, listen, God, God wants you to say, let me tell you what he's done for me. He wants to move in power in your life. Give your life to him. Give, him. give him everything. Give him your all. Give him your all for 2016. Commit yourself to him. Because he wants to move in power in your life. He says, this is the year that I, I just, wanna, I just want, want you to break free from those things that you've been allowing in your life just because, well, you know, we live in America and we can do them. And then tomorrow is the, the day that I'll, I'll change. Tomorrow I'll change. No, today is the day of salvation. Listen. He's a good, good father. Do I have the words down here? Where did I put that? Listen to what verse 2 says. He says, I, I've seen many searching for answers far and wide. But I know we're all searching for answers only you provide. Because you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. That's who you are who you are, who you are, and I'm loved by you. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. 
the only way that we can walk in the way of his holiness and do the sea is by allowing our good, good Father to love us and to show us who we really are, who we're really meant to be. So let's stand together right now. And as we worship a little bit of this song, the altars are open. You can come forward or right at your place where you're, where you're seated or where you'll be standing. Commit yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, I want your power to move in my life. Let your love, the love of a good, good father, do a deep work in my heart. Change me and make me more like you. Let's worship the Lord.